Tony D'Angelo back on here, Connecticut morning. It's the hour two, 11 o'clock, and uh, we're soon to be joined by my friend Kevin Bendel. Kevin is a longtime 23 year coach in cheerleading. He is a sports fan, he is a dad, he is. Uh, well, he's Stanford, Connecticut. He's bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh and blood of my blood. We've had some great talks, you know, over the time uh, we have become acquainted. And, uh, you know, I love Kev because we can just start throwing things around and uh, kind of talk like we're the only people in the room. And in many ways, we very well may be. Kevin, how you doing, pal? I'm doing good, Paul. How about yourself? I'm doing okay. Thank you very, very much. And. I, I don't know really where to begin today, but you did mention something to me the other day. Now, you coached for 23 years, is, is that right? That's what I did. I coached varsity cheerleading 23 years at Bethel High School, Lyman Hall High School, and Longford. I coached the Kinlaw Hayes Thomas and Stanford. I started a program at Wright Tech, and I coached the Brookfield High for six years, and I've won 36 championships. Wow, and, and, and I mean, so so you have uh, exclusively, if I could use an SAT word, coached young women. Is that a correct statement? Yes, I have. Anywhere from the amount of 20 to 15. <laughs> Boy, that that's really something. And, you know, and, and I'm curious, um, you know, like if I'm out on a Sunday early on, I'll, I'll put on WFAN and I'll listen to uh, you know, very fine show, uh, Rick Wolf, The Sports Edge, and it's entirely about youth sports and some of the things that, that you hear, I mean, like things that you and I had never experienced, you know, way back when, and I, you know, I, I, I shake my head. In your 23 years, um, did you notice any, uh, shall we say, culture changes um, between parents, kids, what parents expected, what kids expected, um, personalities, families, you know, you name it, tell us. Well, one of the things that I've really noticed over the years is dedication and commitment. Um, I think that the kids that I've coached have been Is it like today, you know, um, 
we 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 kind of knew our place of things, and, and, and with with uh, smartphones and Facebook and you know YouTube and all this, is it like everybody's a star or everybody wants to be a star or everybody thinks there's a star? I I don't get it. I mean, you you have to help me here. Well, what it is is, what it is is, you know, so get this up at the lower levels. Okay, I, okay, I'll use an example. Say we start at the top one level, okay? We start at the top one level, you know, couldn't it be an outstanding running back or girl would be one of the best cheerleaders in the in the uh, in your organization? And then when they come up to high school, we're in a rule awakening and they're at the bottom of the box. Then what happens is because their kid doesn't have varsity, you don't get this. Well, my, 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 I mean, I hear this all the time from Bob Lazari, uh, who says that, you know, he talks with the people working in his school in upstate Connecticut, and it's like, the, it always comes back to the same thing. We are expected in a school to be parent, counselor, effectively raise the kids when the parents aren't the least bit interested, in it, but yet we're being held accountable for it. And it's a, you know, it's, it's a terrible thing. I mean, if you take economics on top of that and the fact of, you know, divorces, broken homes, foreclosures and everything, kids don't have that stable thing anymore. You know, when you're, you know, it's like one parent and you're driving through McDonald's and you, know, you eat your dinner again another night out of a bag. I mean, something's terribly missing here. I, I, my humble opinion. Well, the way I see it is I think society is still paying attention. I said that, you know, the great taxes and like you said, you got broken homes, you got two parents that work, you know, and I coach girls now for like I said, 23 years. I got to be a psychiatrist. I got to be a doctor. I got to be a psychologist. You know, you have to be. You have to be a lot of things. And we're we're playing as the coaches, like as you and I know, and Nicole Gioni and uh, Coach Ragazzino. We didn't wear that off and say something like we're going to go to the administrator on you. You would have got killed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you wouldn't have gotten out the door. You know, you wouldn't have gotten out the door. You know, you wouldn't have gotten out the door. You gotten out the door. You probably would have put up that grab by the back of your shirt and throw it out. But nowadays you just can't do it. You just can't do it. It's very, very, very hard. And, uh, you know, you got to get the kids to buy in with you. You have to get the parents to buy in with you, you know, that this is all right. Especially with me. I walk a very thin line because I'm a male coach. Right. I'm a female, you know what I mean? The other thing that I have found out is, the only way that we used to coach years and years ago, because I did baseball, you know, I got in a lot of trouble at one of the high schools because I told the father was having pitching lessons from day for me. I told the father to stop wasting his money, and the cops got all upset about it, you know. Mm -hmm. But to make a long story short, when you get involved with females, it becomes a respect line. They respect their side of the street, and I respect my side of the street. You know, it's two, two ways there. And with parents with this, you know, the first thing that I do is I can paint a letter on do you mind me putting your, my hand on your daughter to stop them in some stunts? Because that keeps me clear of anything that could be sexual or anything that could be like right. that. But parents nowadays, if they look, if a kid complains right away, you lose. And I had a very good friend of mine that that happened, so he lost everything, his wife, his house, oh. his kids. And what happened at the very end was they found out all three girls conspired against them because they didn't like them as a coach. This is what you're dealing with. 
It, and, and, and you know what? What did your friend want to do? He wanted to do something good for his community, and that that that's the horrible thing. That's yeah. the that's the horrible thing. And we're all in it to work this song. You know that I'm not in it for God's glory. Those things belong to God. I'm in it for the kids. Keep the kids off the street. You know? Oh, yeah, no, for sure. And, and, and I mean, it's just, I, you know, I wonder, and, and, and here I am, as you know, I'm not a parent, but I'll go out like on a weekend, especially in the summer, and you'll get a, yeah, you get a gorgeous day now. I, you and I are of an age where literally you would drive around Stanford or walk around Stanford and you could not find a place to play baseball or softball or whatever it was to do to play, to practice, to do whatever. And, uh, you know, it's like, and I think a lot of that was, was really, uh, you know, the onset of Title IX where the girls had the same uh, access to the field as the boys, so to speak. And today you just drive by open fields, and then just just a moment, my, my producer is, has waved me uh, for a commercial. I, I think we can go straight through on this, but the um, the, the the interesting thing is, um, I'll go today, and, it's, and Kevin, it's gorgeous. It's seventy something degrees. I've got the sunroof, you know, open in the car, and I'm thinking, wow, this is beautiful. And I'm driving by the Pomfret School, and it's, no one is on the field, and I'm saying. What is wrong here? Kids do not like pick up a bat and pick up a ball and go to a ball field. We know like, we did it all the time. I yeah, I don't get it. Yeah, and you know that I was down the street for two weeks ago. And I went to Belltown and I, I down to Belltown and then spring there. No one's on the field. No one. You it's, know. And, and and it's like when I do go to Stanford and I say, wow. No one's on the Ripawan Diamond at four in the afternoon. It's like this is bizarre world. This to me is unthinkable. Right? I mean, I grew up eating dirt. You know what I mean? I grew up eating dirt out here. I grew up playing ball. I grew up playing football. Yeah. You know, mostly playing basketball, but most of my biggest sport was baseball. You know, I was out there continually. I'd be out there about oh, over. You know, and I was out there about over. You know? Oh sure, and you, know, you you played until the snow fell, and if the snow melted before the next snow, you you, you played even then. It's just I, I I don't know if it's the thing of like there's just too many things and too many outlets, or kids are overscheduled, or parents are you know so it's in any number of things, and it's sad because we really do cheat our young people, and you know we we don't give them that. That, that team building experience, you know, really, and you know, a large part about sports is, um, you know, my, my belief, um, per, per, perhaps by being one more than the other, you learn a lot by losing and, and, and learning from losing as opposed to winning all the time. And, you know, today it's like if you get discouraged, you, you walk away and you don't do it and you go, you go do something else. And, you know, and the, and the sad fact of the matter is, you know, life, life will throw you some bumps. Sports will allow you to, you know, learn how to deal with that. And we just don't give that kind of character development anymore. And I, I believe we all suffer. Right. And I agree with you there 100%, Tony. We don't build enough character. We don't build enough self-esteem into these kids. And one of, the, one of the things that really gets to me is, you know, because I'm a lot around football now, you know, with the cheerleading and right. all that. I'm around two sports, basketball and football a lot. But I've also had three granddaughters that are in Pop Warner. My daughter is a coach who cheered. She was on two national championship teams, my uh, little daughter. And I was with her, and I'm listening to these guys coaching Pop Warner, nine and ten year olds, and instead of teaching them fundamentals, they're screaming at these kids like you're coaching at UCLA or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? And uh, I went down there, I actually was a spectral coach one time. I said, what are you gaining by screaming at these kids? How are you going to turn them off to the game? You know? It's, you, you know, and, and, and that's the whole thing. Um, we've had, Bob Lazari and I have had a number of people on our sports show in, um, in, in Wyndham, and, and Mark, uh, our producer, has worked there, you know, for a long period of time as well, enduring both of us, and the, uh, every single person we had who was a member of the Pittsburgh Pirates at some point has said the same thing. They became Pittsburgh Pirates and they came into the clubhouse 
And of, of course, the honor of being a Pittsburgh Pirate in that time was meeting Wooly Stargell. Wooly come over, kind of you know, poke around with you, and he'd say, "Remember something? When after the national anthem is played, the umpire yells, play ball.' Uh, he doesn't say work ball. He says play ball." And, you know, it's like, uh, it, it's, it, there's got to be some joy in this thing, and it's just, uh, I, I, I don't know, you're, you're seeing it more than I might, but I, I, I'm not really getting that feeling with what little youth sports I might see. You know, uh, you know the problem is what you said, you play ball, but nowadays you play ball for how much money? <laughs> <laughs> you know, 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 Mickey Mayo once said, when we came, when we came to the black box, we brought blood to the spikes. Now they come with a warrior and a briefcase. <laughs> and who's right? If you yeah. really look at it. Now I listen to a couple of interviews, but you know, Tony, I'm a big Mickey Mayo fan. Oh, know? yeah, I know. Yeah, you, you and I can go back for a long period of time. I understand that. And um, one of the things, you know, the Mick always said, the Mick always said he remembered going in for the year, he won the Triple Crown. He remembers going in getting the first paycheck and would ask the wife why he didn't get his pay raise in there. And he said, well, we're going to take the crown again this year and look at the pay raise. You know, a lot of the things that Neil said, he could see a lot of this coming. You know what I mean? A lot of the old timers. You know, it was a sad thing to see like this weekend. You looked at Joe and Whitey, they couldn't even get out of a bad car. Yeah. Know? And you remember these guys. You remember these guys like I do. You know, we're talking about like Mayo and Maris and the 61 Yankees with the, the home run records going. But they also forget to mention that you had three catches on the Yankees and hit 20 or more home runs that year. You had Barrett, Howard, and Blanchard. Yeah. People forget about that. You know what I mean? And, and, and then you had guys like, uh, you know, Zeke Bella and Charlie Silvera that just rotted because they couldn't get into games. It was amazing. Oh, yeah, you know, you look at you look at it, so many you look at so many guys that said I'm a Yankee, but they don't say never stepped on the field. You know, I had a guy that thought God bless his soul. He passed away here uh, a few years ago. He was 93, and uh, we were talking uh, one day and found out he played for the Yankees just after murder his row, but he said he never stepped on the field. Yeah, it's imagine that. Well, you know, but, but, but you talk about, um, there, there was a gentleman um, whom, whom I did not know personally, but <clears throat> he, he was in Greater New Haven, um, Dick Tettelbach, uh, who played, actually, uh, he was the shortstop of Harvard. He tried to come up, I guess, in the 50s. He's listed. He played like five games over, you know, four years or something like that. And, you know, kind of uh, right. didn't make it in baseball. But the whole thing was that, uh, you know, how do you get around Phil Rizzuto? I mean, how do you get around Tony Kubek? You don't. You know, that that, that was really the sad thing. But, uh, you know, right, but, but right. You, you talk about an entirely different thing, Warren. I mean, and, and tell the kids out there. Um, how many Major League Baseball teams did there used to be? You know, it's <laughs> a little, little yeah, different yeah. than what it is now. Yeah, you know, well, you actually look at it, you actually look at it, I was reading something and I was also at that lecture and we're going back to Doug Plank again. He was telling me out of all the colleges that you have in the United States and all the athletes that you have at the high school level, only 1% ever get a full ride, ever get a full, full scholarship. And he said, then take that number and he said, how many of them actually go into the major league? He said, maybe we draft a thousand? How many of them hit the top of the big one? A hundred? I mean, look at the guys that were from Stanford, Ripperwong, Stanford Tackle, mm -hmm. uh, Artie the Phillips. Artie was probably one of the best center fielders I ever saw. I played with Artie, yeah. Yeah, he uh, and, and, and he tells us this very sad tale where I guess it was 1976, he was scheduled to go up for Texas. You know, he's finally going to make the club, and then it rained. Uh, and then during the rain, the, the period of rain, they uh, somewhere got Joe Horner and you know forever banished him to the minor leagues. And oh man, I just wish he had like one shot to play. And it's it, it just it's so horrible. It really is. Right, he was tremendous athlete. Yes, he could hit. I was playing in the industrial league in Stanford for a few years. Well, I still live down there, and I remember watching him play center field, 
and he still had the same arm, the same stride, just graceful to watch, you know? And, and he had that, 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 that beveled lefty swing that only the very good left-handed hitters have, like the, uh, like the Babe Ruths and the Pepitones. Uh, you know, kind of that, you know, it, it's a perfect swing for the old Yankee Stadium because it was just uh, anything, you know, uh, chest to bell high, you're going to take out of there. And, oh, such a, su such a sad tale. And, you know, what, what a pitcher he was. And, of course, if you're signed by Washington in those days, of course, Washington was, you know, first in war, first in peace, and every year last in the American League. You're the, the highest prospect in the country because you're the first draft pick for crying out loud. Yeah, you know, and it's... And it's... You know, you look at these, you look at all of these, like you're saying, the high draft prospects and all of that, but look at everybody that's in the way of what you're doing, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. Now, here we go, you got Alex Rodriguez, okay? He's a $10 million man a year for, for whatever the hell, how many years they signed him for, and he's in the way of a team that could possibly come up and play the game better, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you and, know... And, you know and another thing that's coming up right now, is, and I was going to bring this up to you, because I know you're a Yankee fan like I am, is all that Robinson, uh, Robinson Cano don't get stuck in the middle of this like a Bobby Mercer. You remember those years? Oh, I do. I do. You know, that's where I'm hoping to get happen, that he gets stuck in there with an old crowd, and, uh, and he can't, you know, they can't keep up to the stand, and he gets stuck in there, you know? Well, you know, that's a good part about the Yankees and the thing is you know there, there always seemed to be money for the party you know they, they, they kind of hit a thing like this when people getting hurt or injured or wow well, you know we got to pay off Kevin Brown or we got to pay off Glen Allen Hill or something like that yeah we can pay them off and sweep that under the rug because we got you know buckets of money who cares now it just seems like and, and I really kind of focused in on this because it's not the sort of thing that I might look at a lot ordinarily but um, when I did the ESPN show a couple weeks back and uh, I, I was looking at the Yankee AAA roster uh, because there's a minor league segment in the show and I had to study up for it and you know it's like anybody who's worth anything now um, is up with the big club and I was saying to the guy covering the minor leagues is there anybody here who you know we could be hopeful about and he said really right now no and it's just I mean is is, is the Yankee party kind of over or like if something doesn't happen are they buyers or sellers at the uh, at the trade deadline what are your thoughts uh, that's, 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 a good, that's a hard thing to answer about that's a real hard thing to answer um, like I said I would do whatever I Well, you know, and the other thing is um, this this Yankee culture, if you will, if you, you know, if, you, if, 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 if culture's a, you know, a, a good term to use, uh, you know, it, it's like, well, we're Yankees, we're supposed to be there in October. What, what do you mean rebuilding year? And, and I think it's this thing of the Yankees have this pressure that you're supposed to be there every year and something's terribly, you know, you'll alienate and get everybody incredibly upset if you're not. And, I mean, you know, believe me, I'm, I'm not a, a um, I respect Brian Cashman. I get irritated with him a lot of the time, but I mean, that's not an easy position to be in because I don't think you keep, you, you can't make everyone happy regardless of what you do. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, you know just as well as I do, the two records used to play baseball in Boston and New York. Right. The pressure is insurmountable to perform. You have to perform. You know what I mean? Uh, the difference with 30, 40 the whole world of the year, you're going to have 30, 40 years every year, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like Mantle, you know, Mantle, he, he survived it because he could do it every year. He played ball until he couldn't play anymore. And like he said, I could have had a few more years if I didn't abuse my body. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you know, it's just like that. You know, you look at it, it's like, you know, you look at the center fielder. Well, you know what? 
where you see that, if you look at that, there's a couple of, you know, recorded broadcasts, I think the technical term is kinescopes of the 1952 World Series that you can see or you can see them online. At one point, he hits a ground ball, and this is the mantle, you know, that I, I, I saw the mantle who could run, but he was limping a bit. I mean, believe me, I mean, this this was beyond Ricky Henderson's speed. I, it was amazing. It was amazing how fast. Hey, Oh yeah, he was fast. I watched him. I watched him. You know, early in his career, not as early in the fifties, but you know, in the late like 58, 59, 60, in there, he could fly. He could fly. Still, he still had legs. Yeah, and he still had legs. And, 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 you know, I think it was, and the thing is, you know, he just kind of broke down in a hurry, and it was really a sad thing. And, you know, then, then in that Yankee lineup in the late 60s, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, what do you do? I mean, you, you stick Joe Pepitone behind him, a, a very, very, very good hitter when Joe had his mind on the game. You know, some of the time he did, some of the time he didn't. Probably could have been the next DiMaggio if he did have his mind on the game. But, uh, you know, it's like, you know, who are you going to fear? So you're not going to give Mickey really anything good to hit. And, you know, Mickey's you know, going to be whacking at bad balls and popping up and striking out. Right, right, right. You know, i got a very good friend that designs and signs, Dan McKee in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. You want to see some of the, uh, some of the artwork over here. He is done. But then he put a picture of me from Mickey Mantle. You'd swear to God it was taken right out of his yearbook. Yeah, it's... Uh, Mick Mick was really quite a quite a story, and you know he was he he was fun to watch. And I mean the the, the poor guy. I mean he just uh, you know in many ways he and Martin were kind of you know they they liked a good time, and they were their own worst enemies, and their lifestyles kind of you know provoked their undoing. And uh, you know I. Um, I'll tell you, I miss Billy Martin even to this day because I, I knew that when Billy Martin was managing a game, regardless of what was there, if, if Billy had his head in the game and if he showed up at the game sober, uh, you know, you, you had more than a fighting chance to win. And that's what I really miss about Billy. Hey, did you want to hear a story about Billy Martin when he didn't hold on to I put it this way, I have, but please tell it to our, uh, our viewers. They may not have. Well... One year later, I took uh, Martin home to go hunting, and uh, what happened was uh, they went out to a place, the farmer that Mayor you know, and he said to uh, the, the farmer, said, hey, Nick, would you do a favor, well, shoot that mule, he said over there, uh, he said, I don't have the heart to do it. <laughs> well, he shot the mule, the mule shot the mule, and Martin walked up, and what the hell did you do that for? He said, I have a favor, go turn right in front of me, and Martin stood up and shot three cows, and a thousand bucks. <laughs> Boy, that 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 yeah, you know, and it's interesting because uh, you know, uh, to to those that follow us, next Monday night in Willimantic, we're supposed to have on Greg Pryor, who was a uh, middle infielder for the White Sox and the Royals in the '80s. Apparently, was a member of the Royals. Uh, at the time uh, of George Brett and the pine tar incident and all of that, he claims, and then I'll, I'll, you know, I'll post this when it's available, he claims he's got a never-before-told story about the whole event. But I'll tell you, that, that had to be, and, uh, and, and, and believe me, I, I, and I'm a great respecter of Lee McPhail. I thought he was a great league president and he was a great executive, but uh, I honestly, truthfully uh, thought that uh, the rule should have stood and the Yankees should have won the game because the rule was the rule. He had on too much pine tar in the bat, and, you know, he was, and, and Martin kind of put that in the back of his head and said, you know, if ever I'm going to, you know, need this, I'm going to use it, and boy, I'll tell you, what, what, a, what a great piece of managing that was. Oh, he was a great man. There's no doubt in my mind, no Martin knew game. He knew the game. Yeah. He, he really, truly did. But, uh, Kev, I can't believe it. We're running out of time. I've got a whole list here, and what we're going to do, I think, is we'll have you on close to football season because I wanted to get into the whole thing, which I'm sure will develop by the time we get to it, of all these NFL players getting arrested and Aaron Hernandez, and this morning we found a Giants linebacker with a switchblade in his... Uh, in, in his case at the airport, and it's like, I, you know, to, to me, this is not the, the Maras, the Roonies, the Models, and, the, and you know, the Andy Robeses and uh, the Hallises. We completely lost this world, and, you know, you and I have got to get it back.
What a world. And, and, and Kevin, it's guy, guys like you that somewhat can keep me sane to the degree it's uh, happening. Uh, Kev, where can our uh, friends and fans reach you if they uh, like to chat you up for other shows and other commentaries on youth sports and whatever else you want to tell them? Always have my email. You can always reach me at KevinBendel at God bless you, my friend. Go in peace. We'll talk soon. Thank you, Tom. God bless. Take care. My pal, Kevin Bendel. And uh, I, uh, much, much, much more to come. Talking to Kevin is like boxing in the 1960s, as Howard Cosell would say. It always feeds off of its own energy.